Okay, we are going to get started. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here today. My name is Kaylee Zazula, and I'm the Program and Education Coordinator for Travis Audubon. I want to welcome you to today's lunch series. I also want to thank you all for your interest in this lunch series program. The initial plan was to just do the series in June, but due to the overwhelming popularity, we decided to expand it into July and then into August. After today, we will have two more for the month of August, and then in September, we will move into our regularly scheduled monthly speaker series, which will continue to be virtual. You can check out the calendar on our website to see the upcoming speakers, as well as other virtual events and classes. We will get started on the presentation soon, and in order to prevent any audio or visual distractions from our speaker, we ask for you to turn off your video and microphone if it hasn't been done already. Throughout the presentation, you are welcome to use the chat function, and we encourage you to leave questions there. At the end of the presentation, I will be having a question and answer session with Patsy using the questions you leave in the chat. With that being said, it is time to introduce today's speaker, Patsy Inglet. Patsy is a native Texan originally from the Houston area, although she lived and worked 25 years overseas as a teacher with her engineer husband, Tom. They retired to the San Antonio area in 1999 and started their new career as professional volunteers. Bird started as a volunteer interest, but have now become a passion and a focus of Patsy's educational and conservation efforts and recreational activities and travels. She and Tom have traveled to every continent to see as many birds as possible, banded birds in the field, monitored birds in the nest, and taught many children and adults the basics of birding. As current president of Bear Audubon Society, Pat, Patsy supports National Audubon Society initiatives within the nine county area that Bear Audubon serves, working to ensure that the birds we enjoy today will be here forever. Connecting people of all ages with nature via birds and helping to conserve our natural legacy have become top priorities in Patsy's life. Sparrows, which are the topic of today's talk, are one of her favorite groups of Texas birds. And now I'll pass the virtual microphone off to Patsy. Well, thank you so much. It is not only a pleasure, but it's an honor to be asked to speak to Travis Audubon. And uh, especially about one of my favorite groups of birds, the sparrows, because uh, Bear Audubon is actually, I mean, uh, Travis Audubon is actually what is, um, created my love of sparrows. Dr. Byron Stone's sparrow workshops that he offered at the Cibolo Nature Center a few years ago got me hooked on sparrows. He taught me what I didn't know. He taught me how to learn what I needed to know. And I always be grateful to him for uh, bringing me into this wonderful world of sparrows. Now, a lot of people um, call these guys LBJs. Uh, they call them little brown jobs, and sometimes they'll add the word boring or something like that. But I don't look at them that way. I look at them as little brown jewels. They are beautiful little birds. They are uh, a lot of people that are uh, not as familiar with them. They don't have the knowledge or the awareness to just see how fascinating they are. So that's what I wanna do today. I want to talk to you about uh, how wonderful this group of birds is. Now, if I can get my, there we go. Now, some of you may remember the guy on the left. He's a comedian named Rodney Dangerfield. And his tagline was always, I don't get no respect. That was it. And sometimes the sparrows don't get the respect they deserve. Uh, yet we know, if you think about it a little bit, they're one of the most important groups of migratory and resident birds in Texas. And they're well worthy of our serious attention and they have subtle beauty, they have wonderful diversity, and they have lots of interesting characteristics. So I found out that in Austin, Texas, there's a group, uh, a music group called the Lovely Sparrows. And I just love that because that's the way I think about sparrows. I think they're lovely, softly, beautiful, subtle birds. So uh, let's get started on expanding our uh, awareness and knowledge of this group of birds. And I wanna just share with you some of the things that I think are so cool about them. Now, you know, there's people on this planet that think there's only one sparrow, and this is the house sparrow. Of course, here we have a male and a female, and, you know, they, we probably most of us know they're not even a native bird to the United States. Uh, they were brought in, introduced, they, they really came from the Middle East and spread with agriculture through Eurasia, 
and uh, they were brought over uh, to the United States in the mid-1800s, 1851, to try to uh, curb uh, an in insect infestation. They thought they would eat the insects. So um, by 1900, it had spread over to the Mount Rocky Mountains, and because in the 1870s, there were further introductions in San Francisco, Salt Lake City. And so now it's spread throughout the North America, except for really North Alaska and Canada. And, you know, their constant presence, they're so familiar that a lot of times people just overlook them. And their tendency to displace native birds from nest boxes causes some people to resent them. But house sparrows have a capacity to live intimately with us humans. And their success is they're just beneficiaries of our spreading and they're really adaptable little critters. They're pretty cool. And if you live in the hill country, what would a hill country H-E-B be without a house sparrow nest in one of the letters, usually the E. Here's the little guy looking out of the nest at you. And they sit outside the H-E-B telling everyone that H-E-B prices are cheap, cheap, cheap. So you have to, uh, uh, you have to uh, appreciate them for that. But still, some people say house sparrows are overadapted, oversexed, and over here. And they call them feathered rats. Wow, talk about no respect. I hope that we can't, none of us feel that way. Well, so if they're not native sparrows, where, what are native sparrows? Let's look at that just a little bit. Just about the word sparrow. It comes from an old Anglo-Saxon word because there's not any new Anglo-Saxon words. Uh, the word was spearwa and it meant a flutterer, something that fluttered. And this is how the little small birds in um, Eurasia got called sparrows. Uh, in England, in the UK, and in Europe in general, we have, they call them English sparrows, we call them house sparrows, and then we have the Eurasian tree sparrows, and they're the real sparrows of the old world. They also call the bird at the bottom here, which is uh, called a, a, a hedge sparrow, it's really a dunnock, and it's not in the same family as the other two. The other two are in family Passeridae, the old world sparrows. The other one, it just kind of looks sparrowy. Well, this is what happened when the, the colonists came over to the United States and they saw little brownish birds that were streaky and ate seeds and acted like the sparrows on their doorstep back in England, that they call them sparrows. But however, they will, we found out uh, just recently and not too long ago, that uh, they're really not all that, that closely related and they really shouldn't be placed in the same uh, family. Now, if you remember Biology 101, I was a biology teacher and this is sometimes all the thing, only things my students remember from Biology 101 was the hierarchy of classification, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And uh, with birds, they, they're all the same in the first three. They're all animals. There are chordates. They have, a, uh, of course, they're vertebrates. And then they're abbeys. They all have feathers. But when we get to the order and we look at the birds, the, the 10,700 species of birds of the world are divided into 41 um, orders currently. This changes, you know, with the taxonomy. And the word always ends in formes. So sparrows are in the uh, order of passeriformes, the passerine birds. Some people call them the perching birds or the song birds. That little group, of that it's 60% of all birds on the planet. It's a very, very successful order of birds. Next down, we have the families. And there are 248 families of birds still on the planet that are still living on the planet. Uh, they all end in IDAE. And the, the New World sparrows now are classified in passerellidae. Now, up until an, a few years ago, the Old World and buntings and the New World sparrows were all lumped into a, a family called Embarazidae. You may have heard of that. Uh, and then they started looking, they pulled down their genes and looked at their DNA. And they found that uh, those two groups had split apart like 12, 15, 13 million years ago. And they really shouldn't be in the same family. So these days, the New World group is called Passerellidae. The Embarazidae uh, still has the Old World buntings, and Passeridae still has the Old World sparrows. So now our, our group has its own family name. And of course, as you know, the genus and species uh, together gives the, the scientific name of the bird. 
Now, New World Sparrows, the Passerella day, uh, have 29 genera and 131 species. And um, they are, a lot of them are called sparrows, uh, but then some of them have more exotic names like Chlorospingus and brush finch. Uh, they range from uh, Northern North America all the way down to the tip of South America through Central America. And they're quite Catholic in their choice of landscape. They live in Arctic barrens, desert scrub, tropical rainforest, you name the habitat, you will find a, a group, um, uh, a member of this group. And as you go from the North to the South, they send it, tend, tend to get bigger and they tend to get more colorful. You know, everything gets more colorful toward the tropics. They feed on seeds and fruit. And of course, most of them take invertebrates during the breeding season when they're raising those babies. There's a lot of similarities and of course, a lot of differences. 18 species are threatened, mostly ones from Mexico and South America. Now, today we're gonna to look at these um, New World Sparrows. And I re hardly recommend this book if you haven't seen it. It's a Pe Peterson Reference Guide to Sparrows of North America. And it's by Rick Wright, published in 2019. And it is not a field guide. It tells you all kinds of cool stories about who discovered these sparrows, who named them, why did they name them that, and all the history of their taxonomy and so forth. And I just love that kind of stuff. So you might like to check that out as well. Now, when we get to Texas sparrows, here's a, a little assemblage of Texas sparrows. And limiting yourself to Texas doesn't limit you very much because Texas hosts more species of these North American sparrows than any other state in the union. Now I'm a native Texan and I will tell you that it's not bragging if it's true. And that is true. So more of those species, either they're resident here or they migrate through here at some part of the year. So we have a beautiful diversity of sparrows in Texas. In fact, central Texas is um, sparrow heaven. It really is. There's 20 to 25 different species that you can see. And of course, a lot of them are migratory and we see them in winter. Cold weather, uh, dreary weather is really sparrow weather. So we have some resident spe uh, species here. We have uh, breeders here, but a lot of them do just migrate through. So we also have some sparrows that are, they're sparrow in the, the same family, but they're not called sparrows. Well, olive sparrow is a sparrow, but it's a different color. It's not, it's not green and streaky like a lot of them. The juncos, the lark bunting, and all the toys are in the same family as the um, things that we call sparrows. Now, uh, by whatever name we call them, by whatever way we classify them, they are cool. And I really think they're subtly beautiful and they're interesting and they're a worthy challenge in the field uh, to uh, identify, but it's worth it. They are accessible in winter. There's, uh, you know, sometimes the birding kind of slows down in some areas. All the warblers have gone away and, you know, we're looking for something to challenge us and so forth. And here's the sparrows. Uh, a lot of them breed uh, further north, but they, uh, they migrate down, but not any of them go all the way to the neotropics. They stay in the upper areas. So we get to see a lot of them. They're pretty cooperative. They tend to kind of like to stay in brushy areas and grassy areas, but they will sit up on a perch or a barbed wire fence or a grass stem and let us see them before they drop back down. So it gives us some practice on our binocular skills. They are birds of grassland and edge habitat. And boy, we got a lot of that in the Texas Hill Country. So we have a lot of places we can go to see these wonderful little birds. And since they're seed eaters, um, especially in the winter, some of them, like I said, in breeding, will eat insects. But uh, we see uh, eating in our, under our seed feeders or on our native plants and uh, our forbs and grasses and so forth. So it's a great diverse group that some people just ignore or avoid, usually because they haven't taken the time to study them specifically. And it does take a little study, but it is a lot of fun to know them. So they're far from dull and boring. They're worth the effort. So just quickly, I wanna go through how we break the code of sparrows. What do you, what do, you do to um, identify a sparrow? Well, the same thing you do to identify any bird, but we're gonna run through it. But I wanna remind you, here's, here's a birder's lament. 
They said sparrow identification requires a good sense of humor, high self-esteem, and a calm acceptance of life's harsh realities. There will be times when correctly identifying individual sparrows is just not possible. I've been birding with some uh, birders that are, you know, really know what they're doing in the field. And they would say, oh, didn't get a good enough look on that one, can't call it. And that gave me hope that I could do it. So yeah, they, they are a lot alike in a lot of ways. They're ground dwellers. They're often a little bit secretive, some more than others. They're generally drab, brownish, and often streaked on the back, on the front, and they have short conical bills. But look at this assemblage of sparrows, the savannah, the white crown, the vesper, and the lark sparrow. They don't look alike. All you have to do is look at them for a minute to know that. There, of course, is no magic bullet to identify a sparrow, just like there isn't for any other group of birds. We always want to look for several good characteristics to uh, make sure we're on the right bird. But if we kind of know what to look for, uh, it'll help us a whole lot. So we're going to go through a few of these. Not, not to teach you how to identify or anything, but just to uh, increase your awareness of what's happening. So if we look at size as a field mark, we know it's always iffy because how far away are you and what have you got to compare it to? With any other group of birds, you have to have, usually it helps if you have a bird you know, and then you have another bird you don't perhaps know at the time, and you can compare them. So, so example, the, the uh, little Spizella sparrows, like the clay color, are some of our smallest sparrows. And then you've got the lark sparrow, which is a big sparrow, but you can see there's not a lot of difference in them, the, the, in, in the size. But anytime we can get anything that we know to compare is great. And then the, the silhouettes are not the same. If you blank out all the color and all the plumage and look at the silhouette, it'll help you kind of get to the right group, the right genus of sparrows. Is it a chunky little monkey and, and, and compact, or is it more streamlined? Does it have a longer tail? Does it have a shorter tail in relation to its body? Uh, does it seem flat-headed? Does it seem to be large build or small build? And is the tail wide? Is the tail notched? A lot of things we can see from the silhouette. And of course, we want to be careful of sparrow wannabes. A lot of these uh, birds, are, especially the females, uh, can be confusing. And if you look at these birds, none of which are in the family Passerellidae, uh, some of them are streaky, some of them are in the grassland and very camouflaged, but the none of them are Native American sparrows. And if you know the larks and the, uh, the uh, finches, of course the house sparrow is the introduced species, Dick Sissel in the same family as the cardinals, and of course the blackbird uh, family for the red-winged blackbird, then you uh, know immediately, and, and the beak is usually the, the thing that will tell you that it is not a sparrow. And of course, if you, uh, this is from an old um, field guide, uh, Birds of North America. I carry this with me to remind me that half the sparrows I might see are gonna be clear-breasted and half of them are gonna be streaky-breasted when I get to see them in the winter. Young sparrows uh, tend to be streaky all over for camouflage, but most of the birds that we see in the wintertime in any way have, dis have molted and they're either gonna be streaky as adults or uh, plain as adults. And this is kind of the great divide. It cuts your options in half, which I like. And of course, your sparrow bod, you need to know the, the parts of the sparrow, but you know what? They're about the same, but this is a generic sparrow and you can see that they're smaller birds, they're you know kind of portly sometimes, but you can, uh, if you don't know these terms, you might need to learn some of these terms, especially the crown and the supercilium, which is a fancy name for an eyebrow. And with sparrows, because they are grassland birds and they often stick their heads above the grasses and come a little bit out of their habitat, their heads are very important in uh, their identification. And there's a few terms that maybe we don't use with a lot of other birds, like mustachial. It's just a line that comes from the, where a mustache would be, on the upper uh, part of the bill and down. And then we have malers or mallers, some people pronounce it one way or the other, which comes from the lower bill. And then in between, some people call this another mallard, or some people call it, I like the term, submustachial, lower than the mustachial. In between the mustachial and 
the mailers. And then we have things like crown stripes and auricular feathers, which are over the, uh, the ears. And sometimes those are important uh, things to look at. And of course, when we see a, a sparrow fly, uh, we look for things like, what well, is the tail notched? Is it round? Is it, um, does it have any white or any other color on it? Uh, what is the proportion of the tail to the body length? All kinds of things that you can see. It's amazing how much you can see if you uh, take a look. Um, I should have mentioned, and I, I want to go back and mention it, that eye rings are very important. Eye lines and whether they break the eye ring and what color the bill is. Now, this is something I didn't realize until I started doing sparrow uh, surveys. Yeah, uh, if you look at an average grassland, it's not homogenous. You have shorter grasses, you have longer grasses, you have grasses with forbs and little bushy things in it, and then you have uh, grasses and forbs uh, and trees, like edge habitat. And if you look at this uh, chart, uh, certain sparrows have certain habitats that they prefer. And if you're managing your property for uh, winter sparrows, you want to be sure you have a variety of those habitats, otherwise you will not attract as many different species. So this is an important thing to, to remember, and it's also a good clue to what it might be. And also some of their behaviors. Uh, some fly, uh, like this bee flight here, well, they'll, you'll flush them and they'll fly a long way and then go back into the grass or they'll perch up and sometimes they'll turn around and look at you. Others, like flight A, you almost step on them before you flush them. They come up out of the grass, go right back down, and then they start running like little mice. So those kinds of behaviors can be very, very important. And of course, when they fly, you get very, very good at identifying your spot, your sparrow butts. Uh, some of them have white along the back and the different uh, colors of their rumps and so forth. So all of those are important for sparrow ID. And then to flock or not to flock. In the wintertime, a lot of uh, sparrows do flock together. Uh, for example, chipping sparrows, you see a bunch of little mice under your feeder and they're all teeny tiny little guys and moving around eating your seeds. But song sparrows, you might see two or three together, usually when they're coming in or uh, going out of their, in their migration, but usually they're loners. So that's another uh, good uh, thing to, to look at. And uh, as, when you flush the sparrows and they fly, you can also tell whether they, uh, you know, if they, if they drag their tail or pump their tail, do they go up when like chippers, when you flush them, they tend, the whole group tends to go up at once into the nearest bush or tree. So all kinds of little behavioral things that are very, very uh, handy. And of course, if you know what group your sparrows are in, the genus, uh, this is where the Sibley guide is really good because at the beginning, of uh, the sparrow section. Uh, he has them divided by their the genera and you can look at see the similarities in that genus. For example, this Spizella, these are small clean breasted sparrows. These are three common ones and if you know that's that's the genus then you narrow your options again and it's very 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 helpful. And a lot of times you see sparrows in mixed flocks, especially if you're in a weedy area where there's lots of different kinds of food and you'll be able to compare them. And that makes it uh, kind of fun too. Now, some sparrows, I, even though they don't breed here, will make little calls and they'll answer to pishing and all that kind of stuff uh, when you're in the field. And this is a song sparrow and that's one of the ones that will actually call and it has a characteristic sound. I hope you can hear this. Some people describe it as whip, whip, whip. Some people say chimp, chimp, chimp. But it's a short little sound that comes from a bushy area usually. And uh, that's a sign that a song sparrow is in there. Now we do have some uh, sparrows that actually start their singing because they breed here or they start practicing their song while they're here before they migrate out. Now I wanna take the rest of the time um, to tell you my 10 favorite hill country sparrows and a little bit about each one. Not so much how to identify them, but just some cool things that I think are really cool about them. And uh, maybe you'll appreciate those uh, pieces of information. 
Now, genus Spizella, as I said, are these small little clean breasted sparrows. And these two, the chipping sparrow and the field sparrow, are very common. Uh, the chipping sparrows, um, a lot of times we see them on, on our feeders or in our yard, eating our seeds in the yard. And uh, they're very common in, in wintertime. In fact, when we see chipping sparrows coming in, we know winter is approaching. And uh, when, it, when they leave, we know it's time for them to breed. Now we live up in the San Antonio area and we don't have chipping sparrows that breed. But you know what? Uh, this year we had one singing in our backyard for about three days. And I don't know if it uh, found a mate or anything, but it, it left after three days. I guess it needed to go someplace else where there were more chipping sparrows. And of course, these are little rusty cap guys. They get kind of streaky in the winter and they have a white eyebrow and they have this, this is the, the famous transocular line. It starts at the beak, goes through the eye, and all the way through. And they have that in all plumages. You get where you can see that. They're clear-breasted, and their, their, name, their name means, Spizella means little finch. So, you know, that's the confusion of between sparrows and finches and so forth. Now, this is the one when the flock flushes, they all jump up at once. And listen to the trill. If you've never heard this, it's a very dry chip, and that's uh, a single chip is uh, a call, and then they, we put it together in a trill, and you hear it. All one pitch. Very dry, chippy, metallic almost. Now, their little cousin, the field sparrow, this is one that Pete Dunn, the bird expert, says looks like a cherub in sparrow's uh, clothes because it just looks kind of baby faced. It's got it's very smudgy looking, doesn't have lines. It's got a little eye ring, makes it look wide eyed, has that lovely little uh, beak, uh, orange beak and legs. And he looks like he tried to put rouge on and he kind of smeared it on his cheek and he rubbed it on the top of his head. Uh, just, a, just a darling. I just think they're the cutest little things. They're in flocks in the winter. They breed here and around in Cibolo. We see the Cibolo Nature Center in Bernie. We see and hear them all the time when we were banding birds at, um, out in uh, Guadalupe River State Park. We heard them too because they sing and they have this crazy little bouncing ping pong ball sound. Start off slow. Cool. Now the genus Melispiza, which means song sparrow. Uh, the two that we have here are, uh, the, neither one of them breed here, the song sparrow and Lincoln sparrow. I think in terms of, if you've ever remember the movie called The Odd Couple, we had uh, two guys, one was a slob and one was a neat nick. And you had Oscar and Felix and they lived together and they had a lot of problems doing that because of their different habits. Well, I think of the song sparrow as kind of the Oscar slobby guy. He's kind of messy in his streaks. Got this big old wedgie mailer here. They both have this uh, big gray supercilium. But when you look at this Lincoln sparrow here, it, it's just the opposite. It looks like, you know, Hercule Poirot may have dressed and put those little streaks on just perfectly. And uh, you can see the, uh, contrast. Now, song sparrows don't usually sing here. The only time I ever heard one the first time was in Ohio, and I thought it was a Buick's Wren until I realized there weren't any there. Beautiful sound. Now, the Lincoln Sparrow, uh, they both kind of like brushy areas, and the Lincoln Sparrow tends to like brush piles. They're the brush pile bird. And um, they'll come out, you can fish them out, and they'll come out for just a minute and dive back in the brush pile. They have a lovely little song, kind of a rollicking uh, bunch of jumble songs, almost like a little house wren with more variety. And they're named after not President Abraham Lincoln, but a guy named Tom Lincoln, who was with uh, John James Audubon and helped collect the first one of these. So it was named Tom Lincoln's Finch. And now it's Lincoln Sparrow. Neat. Now, this grasshopper sparrow is a, another breeder in the Texas Hill Country. They often sit up on grass stems and sing during the breeding season. And it's 
kind of a little chunky monkey uh, bird. It looks flat headed. This one's got his little feathers up a little bit, but when he's relaxed, the, the head looks kind of um, flat. They have kind of a stringy looking tail, like they don't have enough tail feathers. It's real thin looking. Uh, this one is a pretty well colored bird. It's non streaked and it's got that lovely white um, belly. But uh, it is, you know, to call it skulker is an understatement. They'll stay in the grass until you almost step on them. And they like it where there's some bushy blue stem and kind of wettish. And here they come right out and then they dive right back in. So if you see this buffy little thing come out and go right back in, uh, then it, it could be a grasshopper sparrow. And uh, we have a wonderful little call that sounds like an insect. That's part of their name. And they also eat grasshoppers. So listen carefully. This one goes, it goes tiss, kiss, and then So listen to up. And you can hear that quite clearly when you're in an area where they're actually breeding. That's the grasshopper sparrow. Now the next two are kind of what we think of as the prairie sparrows, the shorter grass sparrows, the savannah and the vesper. They're not in the same genus, but a lot of people get them mixed up. They're both streaky breasted. They're both about the same size. They both have a pinkish bill and, a, and pinkish legs. But here is a study in contrast again. Over on the left, the savannah sparrow has got sharp stripes. He parts his hair right down the middle with a white median crown stripe. You can see from way off. And a lot of times they'll have yellow in the lores and right in the beginning of the, of the uh, eyebrow. They look like they stuck their nose in pollen. And um, they're very common out on short grass. We see them a lot on our um, prairie bird uh, surveys. Now the Vesper Sparrow, on the other hand, looks mingly and messy. It's not sharp at all. And they don't have stripes so much as a kind of a blank face with a big eye ring. And look at here, the malar feathers curve around the auricular feathers and make, this is a backward J, on the other side it would look like a J. That's pretty diagnostic. And then if you look on along the, the, the uh, tail of this guy, the, la the outer tail feathers are white. And when and just along the edge, and when they fly away from you, you know immediately whether it's a savanna or a vesper, whether there's white on the tail. That's the last word in sparrow butt identification. This is the savanna, and here's the vesper. Here again, we don't hear that very much, but I'm just playing these. So if you do go to an area where they do breed, you'd want to review that so you'll have that clue. Now the last two, uh, sorry, not the last two, almost the last two, uh, the genus Zonotrichia. Now Zonotrichia means striped hair in Latin. And these guys tend to have stripy heads, so there you go. And these are, the, I call them the Arnold Schwarzeneggers of the sparrows. They're three times the size of like, Spizella sparrows. They're still clear breasted, but they're, they're hunks. And uh, these stripy heads are, are pretty easy to see. Uh, the white crowned sparrow wears a bicycle helmet, stripe in red, uh, black and white, and has that lovely little orange bill. Now the first year birds of both sexes, instead of black and white, they have kind of rusty and cream. And a lot of birders get them mixed up with other types of sparrows. So watch out for that. And then one of my favorites is the white-throated. We don't get as many of those here. We get the white crowned out at Mitchell Lake Audubon Center because they like to be around the um, mesquite. They, we got lots of that. So we hear those out there quite a bit uh, in the winter. Usually they'll do just part of that in the winter time. Now, the white-throated sparrow, you notice there's two different kinds, and that's not about the sex of the bird. There's two different color morphs, and uh, the, this one on the left is called the white morph, and the one on the, the right is called the tan. And for a long time, we didn't understand what was going on there. And it took a biologist working for years and years to figure it out, and they figured out that there was a genetic mutation that on one of their chromosomes, number two, 
that a, a big section of it had flipped and inverted and made you know chromosomes pair up one was this way and one was kind of upside down so here's what happens because of that the two morphs develop the mutations built up on the the inverted part and we get a white one which has the mismatched uh, chromosomes and the other one the tan one has the identical ones now what has this done white striped ones only want to mate with tan stripes white males white mate with tan females tan um uh, i'm getting it all uh white females will only uh, mate with tan males so it ends up being like four sexes boys and girls tans and whites and this has given biologists some really cool clues about how sex chromosomes may have evolved so next time you look at that think about that uh, that chromosome number two this is the famous poor sam peabody peabody or oh sweet canada canada it's a very easy call to know and to recognize. Beautiful little birds. And last in our list, but not least, is the lark sparrow. And it is in its own genus. And anybody who says that sparrows are drab and retiring little birds has never met a lark sparrow. If all sparrows were like this, we'd have no problem identifying them. It's a big sparrow, as you remember from that slide with the um, little um, clay colored sparrow. It's fairly large for a sparrow. It's clear breasted. They often have a, a little mark in the middle of their chest. And they're, when the little ones come hatch out, they don't look quite like this, but before long they're molting into this, this uh, harlequin pattern that you see here. Now, if you notice, they also have white along the edge of the tail. But the difference between them and the Vesper sparrow is the white curves around the edge. So when these guys fly away from it, if you didn't see the head and you couldn't tell that it was the uh, lark sparrow from that, when they fly away from you, they show white corners as well as white stripes along the side. So another way to tell them apart going away. Now, they're named for their lark-like song. And they do breed here. And a lot of times you'll be out uh, and you'll hear something you think, well, maybe that's a Buick's wren or whatever. But these guys have little modules in their song and they seem to enjoy moving the modules around and rearranging them. It's a beautiful little song. Okay, well, I think I've made my case, I hope I have, that uh, they're distinctive, they're quietly beautiful, and they will test our ID skills in a good way. So uh, you will get a handout uh, courtesy of Cornell Lab. They sent this out to me free, and I'm gonna share it with you. It's called the Sparrow Cheat Sheet, and it's got all the sparrows in North America. Uh, start with the ones that are most common around your area. Learn those first, that's always good uh, advice and um, then branch out and learn a few more uh, every year. So keep in mind, no sparrow's ever been maimed just by being misidentified. We're not gonna shoot them or anything. We're just gonna name them. And you know, they don't care what we call them. And go out with somebody that knows a little bit more about the sparrows, but don't let them snow you. If they name a sparrow, ask them, why do you say that? What's, what, what did you see about that sparrow? I, I'm learning, can you teach me? Because, you know, if they say they can identify every sparrow they see, they may lie about other things too. Uh, but really get them to teach you as you go along. And accept that some sparrow sightings just will remain a mystery for even the most expert birders. I don't know about Dr. Birdie, if he's ever had a sparrow he couldn't identify, but I bet he has. Because sometimes you just don't get a good look at them. So I just want to mention, I know that uh, Dr. Byron Stone does a, a sparrow workshop every year in January. We do a prairie bird workshop at Cipolo Nature Center uh, for our surveys. And we're having one on Zoom this year on December 10th, 2020. So if you're interested in that, you can check out the Cipolo, uh, Cipolo.org website. And if, you, if not, please attend Dr. Uh, Byron Stone's class. You'll fall in love with sparrows, I'll guarantee you. He's wonderful at how to teach you. 
So I hope that you never look at a sparrow, whether it's an introduced house sparrow or a, a native sparrow, and think of it as just a little brown job anymore. Think of a little brown jewel. Now I wanna leave you with a poem that was written by a wonderful ornithologist named Drew Lanham. He just published this book called Sparrow Envy uh, in 2020, and I bought it immediately because I love his work. He's a beautiful writer, and I'd like to read it to end this session. Were I the sparrow, brown-backed, skittish and small, I would find haven in thorniest thickets. Search far and wide for fields lain fallow. Treasure the unkempt, worship the unmown, covet the weed-strown row. I would slink between sedges, chip unseen from brambles, skulk deep within hedges, and desire the ditches grown wild. I would find great joy in the mist sodden morning, sing humble pleas from the highest weeds, and plead for the gray days to stay. So thank you so much for inviting me, and if you have any comments, if you have any sparrow stories or any comments or any questions, I'll ask, uh, I'll do the best I can to answer. And again, thank you so much for allowing me to come and talk about my friends, the sparrows. Thank you so much, Patsy. We have um, a couple of questions for you coming in through the uh, chat box. The first one is, um, well, you, you discussed your top 10 favorite sparrows, but do you have a very favorite sparrow? And if so, oh, my goodness. That is so hard. But I, I guess one of my favorites has to be the chipping sparrow because it's one of the first ones that I learned its call. We were out in West Texas and we were up in near the McDonald Observatory and we heard this you know, just crazy out of a conifer up there in the mountains. And we stopped the car and got out and here's this little brown guy with his beautiful rusty head and he's belting it out from the toes. And uh, they're, they're easy to identify and they're everywhere. So I guess that has to be my favorite. We call them chippers. Chippers, yeah. And which sparrows can people see right now around Austin? Well, that's a good question. I don't live in Austin, but I would say that in the hill country, the resident sparrows uh, would be around. The field sparrows, the ones that are going to breed here, uh, the lark sparrow. Uh, we have a, a big uh, park in Kendall County that's really out open, short grass and stuff like that. And we see lots of um, lark sparrows out there. But then as it gets a little cooler into the fall, and it doesn't have to be cold because remember they're coming from north where it gets cold first, uh, you're starting to see. But something I would look for in the fall is the uh, clay colored. And I didn't talk about those, they're Spizella sparrows. The clay colored sparrows come from the north and they come through Texas and they winter on the Rio Grande. Now, as they come through our area, there'll be a whole posse of them, a whole bunch of them, and they'll stop in a bush or a tree and uh, maybe you will remember an old timey doorbell that when you push the button, huh, like a buzzer, it would go meh, meh, like that. Well, if you hear a bush and everything is going meh, 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 you've got a bush full of clay colored sparrows. And they, uh, they're beautiful little guys. Uh, they look very much like a chipper that got washed out. But again, they don't have that dark, I think, but that's a good one to, to look for. And then when they come back north in April, that's another fun one. We get a lot of phone calls on those. What's all this <laughs> making this noise in my bush? Yeah. And in a similar, in a similar vein, um, what plants would be good to attract sparrows um, to your backyard? Native grasses. A lot of people uh, sell the native grasses short. We live in a neighborhood that's pretty laid back. Uh, we have an acre of land and our front look is for the neighbors. You know, it's just neat enough not to get us a letter. You know, we have all native plants and, and in the back, we've let the native grasses go. 
where nobody can see. And at one time we had 50 or 60 different kinds. We let them all go to seed. Uh, if you have um, like Maximilian sunflowers, let them all go to seed and you'll start seeing, uh, we had a bunch of um, little goldfinches out there the other day. So anything that forms seeds or little small um, native plants are always the best, but of course in uh, the seed feeders, uh, any kind of smaller seed, they'll, they'll sort them out. You know, they'll, they'll knock the ones they don't like out and deer the deer will eat those. <laughs> so any, any of those seed bearing uh, plants. And when we, when we met the other day, just the two of us to um, talk, to talk on Zoom, um, you started telling me a little bit about how you first got interested in sparrows. Um, would you like to elaborate on how, when it was that you first got interested in sparrows? Yes, uh, I was of the tribe that thought I couldn't do it. And guess what, when you think you can't, you can't. But then I got interested in doing uh, bird surveys at Cibolo Nature Center and Cibolo Preserve, which is a 600 acre preserve next to Cibolo Nature Center in Bernie. And they wanted people to go out with big long poles and beat the prairie and see what flew out to help them do their habitat management. Well, I just thought that was great. And I got the chance, Tom and I, Tom's sitting over here, my husband, and uh, we got to work with Rufus Stevens, who was one of the originators of the whole Texas Master Naturalist program. We said, well, if Rufus is gonna be doing it, we wanna learn because that way we can learn. So we figured out that mainly what we were gonna see is sparrows. And so then we signed up for Dr. Stone's uh, sparrow class and that was what did it. You know, it was like, well, I can do this. If I just study hard and pay attention and keep working at it. And after he taught the class, I believe he taught it for two years. Uh, he wouldn't, he didn't, uh, wasn't able to do it again. And so somebody came to me and said, would you like to teach the class? And of course this scared the heck out of me. Uh, but the best way, and I'll quote Dr. Stone on this. He said, if you want to learn a group of birds, try to teach it. So now through the study and the attention to the sparrows, I'm pretty confident with the locals. Now, when you travel somewhere else where they're in different plumages and things like that, you have to study a little bit of the locals, but it's been so rewarding uh, to know them. It kind of gives you this feeling, really good feeling in your tummy when you can look at a little bird like that, that everybody's going, huh? And you say, well, you know, let's look at that. And then we figure it out together. It's great. I love that connection between you and Byron, that someone from Travis Audubon inspired you. And now you're here inspiring Travis Audubon members about uh, how interesting that the sparrows can really be. Yeah. It, it, well, we all love the same things, don't we? We all exactly. love that diversity and that wonderful variety of, of life around us. And um, the only last thing I have for you is somebody requested um, for Tom to peek over to the camera and say hi. Oh, okay. Here he is in all of his radiant beauty. There he is. <laughs> That's my partner in crime, my partner in birding for over 50 years now. So, uh, and it's another thing that's so wonderful. We discovered birds at the same time and we go birding together all over the place. And it's been a great thing to keep us going. So I want to just wish you, I'm going to send you a happy wish. The Texas Roadrunner saw a shadow, so it looks like we're going to have three more months of summer. Hopefully not. <laughs> At least hopefully not this hot. We are, we are through a heat advisory this week. <laughs> I'm ready for sparrow weather, aren't you? A little I bit of time. Am. So really thanks so much again for, it's just such an honor. And I want to thank everybody who came and, and listened. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, here's our email at the bottom of the screen, TP, that's Tom Patsy Inglet, that's satx.rr.com. And I wanna thank you, Kaylee, for uh, helping me uh, get everything set up and uh, being such a great partner in this presentation. Absolutely, it's been a pleasure. Um, thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Patsy, for uh, agreeing to give such a wonderful and informative presentation. And um, later on our website, you'll be able um, to pull up that cheat sheet that 
uh, with sparrows that Patsy was talking about on our yeah. series website. So cool. thank you all again, and we hope to see a lot of y'all next week for our next talk. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye-bye.